Personally, it's always been a little bit of a surprise to me how little we focus on the brains of the most powerful people in this country. And I say the most powerful because even the president himself has some sort of checks and balances on his power. But who checks and balances the daily decisions of law enforcers? The hundreds and thousands of police officers that influence the lives of millions of people that live in the United States every day. Who's pressing for the quality and the accountability of these decisions? The tragic and untimely death of a Tatiana Jefferson last week and so, so, so many tragic and untimely deaths of innocent people on the wrong end of these decisions bring them to the forefront of our minds. And as we grapple with such senseless acts, we generally fall into two categories of reasoning. Here's yet another example of cops being the racist scumbags they are, killing black people for sport. Or here's yet another example of a horrible accident, the unfortunate collateral damage of the split decisions that officers simply have to make every day. But neither of these explanations are particularly satisfying. Neither fully accounts for the myriad of factors, social, psychological, neurological factors that influence that officer's decision. And probably more importantly, neither of them identify the specific things that our officers, that our police departments, that our society can do to improve those decisions. The research-based things that we can do to save lives. Well, in this brain snack, we gonna do just that. First, let's take a really quick look at how decision-making works in the brain. There's a stimulus in your environment, say your phone. Sensory neurons in your eyes and ears pick up on photons of light and wavelengths of sound and shuttle this electrical information to and through your brain. This is known as perception. Various regions of your brain process that information, filling that neurological T about what's going on in your environment and what to do about it. This is the action or decision. Now, if it were truly this simple, we would all perceive the world the same way. We would all make the same decisions and none of those decisions would ever be mistakes. Imagine a world with no car accidents, no typos, and no shooting of unarmed civilians. But alas, a host of internal and external factors act on the brain and influence both your perceptions and the decisions you make. Some of these factors we have absolutely no control over. So for instance, we can't control what our brains do when we encounter intense life-threatening situations. It skips processing steps, bypassing the more intelligent cerebral cortex and darting key information to your amygdala so that you can deal with that threat faster. Now this is fine and all except it's not always accurate because that often visual information wasn't fully processed. So an officer is much more likely to make perceptual mistakes in these cases like screaming gun in response to a cell phone when his brain skips steps like this. Again, this response is hardwired in the brains of almost all animals, so there's little that we can do about it. There are, however, a number of external factors that we can manipulate to ensure that the right officers are making the right decisions in even the most intense situations. First, let's take a look at implicit bias. Many police departments adopt an us versus them attitude towards policing. This is explicit bias, and it outwardly dehumanizes black and other communities of color. But implicit bias, it lays below the surface as unconscious or unintentional stereotypes about groups of people. These are more elusive beliefs that honestly most individuals, including officers, have about people in their social outgroups. But these mainly negative associations influences an officer's decisions and actions, whether or not he or she explicitly holds racist views. In a now familiar study known as a police officer's dilemma, participants playing a shooting game are much more likely to shoot black targets, both armed and unarmed, than they are to shoot white targets. But that's not nothing new. More interesting is that we let officers play this game. But before we did that, scientists tested them for implicit bias. And the more implicit bias an officer showed, the more quickly he responded to black targets in this game. So not only was he more likely to respond to black targets, he was quicker to shoot them. In situations where every second matters, and the tenth of a second can mean the end of someone's life, these differences between one officer's brain and the next matter just as much as the lives that they have the potential to take. So here lies the factor that we know makes officers more likely to kill people erroneously. And not only do we know about this factor, we know how to measure it, and how to possibly reduce it. I can't be the only one that sees the one plus one equation here. And it turns out I'm not. Major police departments like Chicago and New York City have taken evidence-based strategies to reduce implicit bias in their departments. Implementing everything from traffic stop protocols to implicit bias training, to changing hiring practices, to recruit candidates that show less implicit bias and have more executive control. Shouldn't this be a national effort? Number two, time. Implicit bias isn't the only negative influence on an officer's decisions. Unsurprisingly, so is a lack of time. Research shows that when we're forced to make split decisions, we're extremely vulnerable to be guided by our stereotypes and prejudices. When participants were given just half a second to decide if a picture they were just shown was a wrench or a gun, they were much more likely to mistake a wrench or a gun if they were also shown a black person's face beforehand. They were much more likely to make this mistake than if they had seen a white person's face or no face at all. Now again, this is pretty hurtful, but considering the history of our country, not that surprising. 
having. But when participants were given just 200 milliseconds, not even a second more of time, the number of mistakes that they made plummeted. They made better decisions. Now, it might seem weird to suggest that time is an external factor that officers have control over. Oh, but baby, it is. In his best-selling book, Blink, Malcolm Gladwell spells out a number of ways that officers can slow things down in even the most intense situations. One includes a strategy known as one-man cars, where an officer reports to certain calls or scenes by himself, or at least with delayed backup. Now, that might sound crazy, but consider the fact that two officer encounters are much more likely to end in assault, arrest, or injury. Two officer teams are much more likely to have complaints filed against them. And you might think that it increased the risk for the officer, but studies show that that's not true. An officer with a partner is statistically no safer than an officer on his own. When an officer is by himself, he naturally slows things down out of caution and reduced bravado. He's more likely to talk than yell. He's more likely to approach and cooperate than charge and in command. He's more likely to read the facial cues and body language of a perpetrator, reducing the need to shoot him. An officer by himself puts time on his side. And for that reason, he's more likely to make the right decision. Additionally, when officers are trained to create time, they see radical improvements in this regard. Police departments that adopt one or more of these policies kill significantly fewer people. Officers don't need to buy a ton of time when making split decisions, but being intentional about 200 milliseconds, less than half a second of time, can make all the difference in an innocent person's life. Number three, experience. When you find yourself in a dangerous or an intense situation, your body pumps out hormones like adrenaline and your heart rate increases. An optimal heart rate to deal with most threats is between 115 and 145 beats per minute. A heart rate below this and your cells simply won't get enough oxygen to move very quickly. But a heart rate above this makes you clumsy and inefficient. You start making perceptual mistakes. Now to the point, when an officer's training includes the simulation of being shot at, on average, his heart rate shoots up to about 175 beats per minute. They fail miserably at that simulation. But by the third or fourth time they've done it, their heart rate settles somewhere in that optimal range. In other words, experience makes an officer much more effective at dealing with highly stressful situations. In an interview with CBS, LaRonda Young, a former Fort Worth police officer, criticized her colleague and said this. My first thought is if I start walking around in the backyard and these people are home, they might shoot me because they don't know who I am. I think if that officer had been more comfortable with the area he was working in, she would have answered them and she'd have been alive today. She also said that it's important for officers to scope out their scene and collect as many sensory clues as possible before knocking on someone's door. This is the 12 years of experience that she had on that force talking. The officer that killed Tatiana Jefferson had been on the force for just one year and was being trained by officers with less than five years experience. The officers that killed Akai Gurley, Stefan Clark, Amadou Diallo, Freddie Gray, Oscar Grant, Samuel DeBose, Fernando Castillo, Alton Sterling, Jamar Clark, Tamir Rice, all had less than five years experience, most of them less than three. Many police departments have systems that put rookie officers on overnight shifts, which makes them most likely to get the calls that they're least prepared to handle. Imagine if instead police departments created systems that put public safety and public interest first. Imagine if we demanded it. Lastly, let's look at power. Growing up, one of my dad's favorite quotes was, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And according to a gang of neuroscientists, he was right. Through a wide range of experiments, psychologists have shown that people with power, even a smidgen of power created in a lab, tend to be less empathic, less apt at considering the perspective of others, and less likely to feel social constraints on their behavior. People with power make more errors when it comes to judging the emotional expressions of others and are more likely to objectify their subordinates, treating them less like individuals. And this is power created in laboratory settings. Can you imagine the implications of this in the real world? The implications of this for the most powerful people in our country? Do these sound like the kind of officers you want riding down your block? Now, it's not like most officers are consciously deciding to become total douchebags. Neuroscientists in Ontario have shown how the acquisition of power literally changes your brain and silences neural pathways involved in empathy and emotional mirroring. But what systems lie in place to curb this potentially dangerous propensity and the people that have the most power? Frankly, the extent to which officers are not held accountable for their actions, the extent to which their daily decisions, even the ones that end people's lives, lives go unchecked just serve to further warp their already extraordinarily power molded brains. Kanye West said it best. No one man should have all that power. Yet we continue to let police officers reign with no real or formidable force against their shower of bullets. So in sum, more of us should be questioning the quality of the everyday decisions made by law enforcement and demanding that resource-based solutions be implemented by our police officers and departments to improve those decisions in their quality, their integrity, and their accountability. It's simply not enough to hold up signs insisting that they stop killing us. We have to peer in the minds of officers and tell them how.